Ever had that sinking feeling, realizing if only I had focused on that thing I started years ago, I'd be so much further along than I am right now? Well, science reveals what causes this grass is greener tendency to split our focus. And most importantly, there's a way to solve it. The neurological roots of shiny object syndrome can be rewired. Now, I'm Rian Dars, co-founder and CEO of the Flow Research Collective. Along with my partner, Stephen Kotler, we've taught thousands of professionals how to access states of flow at will. A while back, I built my training company into an eight-figure organization through three years of relentless, singular focus. Whenever people asked how we managed to pull it off, I emphasized that the secret was to say no to everything and stay focused on that one thing for longer than you thought it was necessary. But with success came opportunities that led me astray. Within six months, something was off. I went from total focus to being spread across five major products, including my original training company, buying a new company, pursuing a PhD, writing a book, and then building a whole content ecosystem. Despite my hypervigilance to saying no to shiny objects, an invisible enemy had snuck up on me and divided my focus. And this was when I realized that while procrastination blocks beginners from getting into the game, something else blocks the advanced from succeeding at the game over the long term. It's internal and it's insidious, and it's something all humans are particularly susceptible to. The problem is our biology makes us victims of something called dispersion. Now dispersion refers to the diversion and distribution of cognitive resources, effort and attention across multiple projects, pursuits or goals that do not directly build upon or compound on each other. In simpler terms, it's going a mile wide, but just an inch deep. And dispersion splits your attention. It compromises working memory. It increases context switching, decision fatigue, and cognitive load. All I wanted was to grow, do more, and achieve my goals. Well, you know how this goes. You feel like you have so much you want to do with your life, and all it takes is the willingness to make it happen. So as I took on these projects, it felt like I was maximizing my potential. But in this insatiable hyperambition, trying to catch every opportunity, I ended up struggling everywhere instead. The training company, once my sole focus, got just a fraction of my time. The new ventures were crawling because I couldn't give them enough attention. The PhD felt like climbing Everest in flip-flops. And the book, it was more of a collection of scattered ideas than a manuscript. So I realized I had fallen into a common trap, assuming that opportunity is in breadth rather than in depth. I'd lost my focus. The irony, in trying to grab it all, I lost my grip on everything. It's like Aesop's fable of the dog in the shadow. In a quaint village, a dog finds a juicy piece of meat and carries it in his mouth. Eager to enjoy it, undisturbed, he heads home. Crossing a bridge, he sees his reflection in the water. Mistaking it for another dog with a larger piece of meat, greed overtakes him. He opens his mouth to bark at the reflection, hoping to grab the bigger piece out of the other dog's mouth. But as he does so, his own meat falls into the stream and is swept away. Realizing his mistake, the dog is left with nothing, learning a hard lesson about the cost of chasing after illusions while losing the thing he already had. Like so many, I had fallen prey to procrastination's older brother. First challenge to becoming a workspace Olympian and achieving your goals is getting the game. Procrastination is what blocks this from happening. It's when we never make the first move. But once you overcome procrastination and gain momentum and success, your second key challenge is procrastination's bigger, scarier, sneakier, older brother, dispersion. Your biology will cause your focus to spread. You'll start to be attracted to more and more things and you'll have more resources and skills. So the temptations will seem easily doable and harmless, which makes them all the more alluring. As these sirens of dispersion ensnare you, the momentum that got you to this level of success in the first place will go flat. Think of it like this, procrastination stops you from getting in the car, so you're stuck at home. Dispersion, on the other hand, stops you from getting to your destination, like a GPS repeatedly sending you down different roads instead of straight down the highway. But here's the counterintuitive thing. Dispersion is even more damaging than procrastination in the long run. With procrastination, the opportunity cost is real, but it's unknowable until you get in the game. On the other hand, with dispersion, the opportunity cost is exponential because you lose access to the power of compounding. This is when growth feeds upon itself. So the longer it continues and the more you add to it, the faster and bigger something becomes, like a snowball rolling down a hill and compounding in size. With procrastination, you miss out on rewards now, but the potential remains for future compounded growth when you start. 
With dispersion though, you trade incredible future potential for small wins today across many areas. So look back at the last decade and consider the opportunity cost of all the skill, knowledge, and creativity that could have compounded, but that you missed out on due to dispersion. It's staggering when you assess it for many people. All the missed promotions, the breakdown of your network, the failed businesses, the lost investments, the places where you went an inch deep, but because you were a mile wide, didn't actually move forward. As Charlie Munger, Warren Buffett's investing partner says, the first rule of compounding is to never interrupt it unnecessarily. And dispersion is how almost all compounding gets interrupted and progress gets reset at the beginning rather than the opposite. Dispersion is like the fickle lover, addicted to the temporary high of fresh infatuation. One day they wake up alone in an empty bed, no intimacy, trust, shared memories, community, or continuity. So it's clear dispersion is the enemy of all progress, professional success and focus. You've undoubtedly heard business titans, philosophers, athletes, and artists talk about this. For example, in the early 90s at a dinner with billionaires Bill Gates and Warren Buffett, Gates' father asked the two of them what they considered the most important factor for their success. Both Gates and Buffett said the same word at the same time, and that word was focus. In particular, this refers to focus not just on the task level, but undispersed compounding focus on the pursuit level over a long stretch of time. So once I realized I'd fall into the dispersion trap, pursuing two businesses, writing a book and working toward a PhD, I slashed everything down and refocused on the single most important thing. And guess what happened? Well, within a month, I progressed more on that one thing that I would have on all five things combined in a year. And that's because the focus began to compound, priorities became clear, stress fell through the floor, and I got way more flow. Now, why does dispersion happen? And is there anything we can do about it? Well, let's look at the neuroscience. Picture yourself as a prehistoric human foraging the wilderness thousands of years ago. You come across a bush bursting with ripe, juicy blueberries. As you eagerly pick and devour the sweet berries, your eyes catch a glimpse of another bush in the distance. Its berries are a slightly darker blue, and you can't help but be attracted by them. Do you continue gorging on the bounty right in front of you or abandon it to go and explore that other tantalizing bush? While eyeing the other bush, you get a rush of anticipatory dopamine courtesy of the nucleus accumbens. Under this dopamine spell, you drop the berries you are munching on and run over to the other bush. This dilemma exemplifies the fundamental trade-off all adaptive organisms face between pursuing a known reward exploitation and sampling lesser known options in search of something better, exploration. But here's the thing, both the mind and the brain make you susceptible to over-exploring. Evolution drives us to scan our environment for more blueberry shrubs, even with the mouthful of berries we still have from the first shrub. This is one of the key reasons why dispersion occurs. Before the discovery of fire, this pattern was great for survival, but it's not so great for avoiding shiny object syndrome while trying to scale a startup. Exploring is gathering sticks, vines, and leaves. Exploiting is building a shelter with them. Most people spend time finding more sticks because it feels good, and comparatively, it requires minimal effort. They get a dopamine hit from the hunt, but they never finish the shelter. Without focused effort connecting pieces, materials go to waste. Our ancestors who made it were the ones who balanced gathering and constructing. They allowed some exploration, but also ensured time and attention were spent exploiting resources on hand. And here's something to keep in mind. If you're entrepreneurial, you're even more at risk for dispersion. Based on the big five personality traits, entrepreneurs tend to score high in openness to experience, which makes them even more inclined to over-explore. Just consider these archetypes on the explore and exploit spectrum, which of these sounds most like you and resonates. First, there's the explorer. This is someone who's constantly chasing the next big idea. Driven by novelty seeking and dopamine, you flutter between projects like a butterfly, unable to focus long enough for meaningful results. The explorer excels at starting new things, but rarely gets anything off the ground and never finishes anything. The exploiter commits to a singular pursuit, resisting urges to chase shiny objects. You go deep into a craft, focusing for years or decades to achieve mastery. While others get distracted, the exploiter persists through boredom. But this hyper-focusing can make you inflexible and blind to new opportunities. The competition can leave you in the dust. The over-exploiter never takes any risks and rarely has big ideas. The captain masters switching between explore and exploit modes and knows when it's time for each. Just as a battlefield captain surveys the landscape, assessing when to advance, retreat, or hold position, the captain knows when to start a new initiative versus when to double down on the current one. This fluidity 
makes the captain effective in both generating ideas and seeing them through. The captain explorer is just enough to stoke creativity, but exploits long enough to realize profound results. And the ideal archetype here is, of course, the captain, a master of explore and exploit dynamics. The captain understands that the golden rule of progress is to do one thing for longer than you think, to allow compounding to occur before you go into explore mode again. But due to our biological tendency to overexplore, most of us never become captains and never really get anything built to a significant size or, in certain cases, never get anything off the ground in the first place. Most of us are puppet mastered by the hidden hands of evolution. But part of evolving as a human is no longer caving into your evolutionary impulses. The goal is to seize the strings and become our own puppet master, guiding ourselves rather than succumbing to our neurobiological craving to explore. We can override that impulse and continue to exploit. And you do this all the time. Just think of the last time you leveraged your willpower in order to stop binging on sweets. Similarly, we want to develop the mental muscle to stay focused on a singular pursuit and not disperse. As we navigate, explore and exploit dynamics, cognitive biases emerge. Cognitive biases distort thinking and perception in ways that aid reproduction yet hinder personal success. These biases emerge from and perpetuate dispersion. For example, the novelty bias drives us to chase shiny new pursuits before mastering current ones. The scarcity bias makes us anxious when we miss out on limited opportunities, spurring dispersion. Present bias overvalues immediate wins compared to long-term compounding returns. Together, these cognitive biases reinforce dispersion, sacrificing enduring fulfillment for fleeting wins. But once you become a captain, defeat dispersion, master explore, exploit that out, you rewire your brain, which allows you to better overcome these biases. In this rewiring, you gain what's called compounding focus. Compounding focus refers to your ability to zero in on a single pursuit for an extended period without splitting attention across multiple priorities. It's a superpower that compounds results over time. Neurologically, with compounding focus, you increase dopamine signaling in the basal ganglia and prefrontal cortex by enabling habitual focus on tasks tied to skill development, which accelerates learning. With compounding focus, you reduce erratic dopamine hits from novelty seeking and reduce overwhelm from excess cortical activation, which steadies your drive. With compounding focus, you strengthen connections in neural circuits related to the selected pursuit through myelination from repeated practice, which builds expertise. You get really good at one thing instead of mediocre at multiple things. And this specialty makes you stand out so you can advance your career and get paid more. With compounding focus, you maximize default mode network rumination, which boosts your creativity. With compounding focus, you conserve willpower by reducing decision depletion from choosing between priorities, strengthening self-control and discipline. With compounding focus, you get clearer goals and minimize conflict between competing objectives, which magnifies purpose, a key intrinsic motivator. You get things done faster and more efficiently, which frees up time and mental space and makes life less stressful. Work feels energizing rather than draining. Financially, compounding focus overtakes the roller coaster income from chasing random opportunities. So here are three science-backed steps to become a captain of your biology. Let's dive into each. Phase one, pick one pursuit. Take a moment to imagine a beautiful oasis waiting for you across a vast ocean. Let's pretend that this island represents your highest professional goals. There are boats at the dock, each representing a different project or pursuit, a means of reaching the island. Since you can't steer multiple boats at once to reach your destination, you gotta pick one boat. So the question is, what's your boat? What is your primary professional pursuit that you wanna apply your compounding focus to? If a primary pursuit doesn't immediately come to mind, map out everything you're currently working on, then consider which pursuit you'd like to go all in on. That is, pretend for a moment that it was the only thing you could pursue and everything else had to be cut. One thing to keep in mind as you do this, don't be fooled by information asymmetry. Information asymmetry is when one party in a transaction has more or better information than the other party. This cognitive bias causes us to perceive complex situations more simply than they really are. When you're not yet fully involved in a new project or pursuit, you're biased toward optimism because you don't have full information about the complexity involved. So the project seems simpler and more exciting than it really is in reality. If you've never played chess, the game looks simple enough. You just move pieces randomly on a board. The strategic depth and countless possible moves are invisible to the outset. The same goes for a new pursuit or project. 
It sounds exciting and simple enough when we're considering it from a position of dopamine distortion. We find ourselves telling our friends about it, talking their ears off over a coffee and painting a picture of how great it will be when the project comes to fruition. But then as you move closer to the pursuit, the information asymmetry shifts and you can actually assess the complexity or difficulty of the project. The complexity multiplies in ways we never could have predicted. Like a kaleidoscope, what first appears as a straight line actually forks into a branching tree of options, which splits into an exponential web of open possibilities. For example, in business, every product, customer avatar, and new employee can cascade into endless variations of possible directions and a swamp of subtasks to worry about. The further we go down a new path, the further we get tangled up in the previously invisible complexity. All of this leads to fractalized, fragmented focus, which is as far away from compounding focus as you can get. To avoid this, list out all your current pursuits and could be pursuits. Maybe you've got a full-time day job and a side hustle of investing. Maybe you've got a business and a speaking career and you're writing a book. Take a moment to map all of these out. And in the list, be sure to include any pursuit that you wish you were doing. Then, now that you've mapped out all of these pursuits, it's time to run what's called a temporal audit. A temporal audit is zooming out on your future to zoom in on what counts the most now. It's considering your 80-year-old self, not just the next eight days. Alfred Nobel, a Swedish chemist and inventor, held over 350 patents, including patents for dynamite and nitroglycerine. Though intended for industry, his explosives were co-opted as weapons, causing countless wartime casualties. This was at odds with Nobel's humanitarian values, and it risked tainting his legacy forever. Then, crazy thing happened. A newspaper published Nobel's obituary, mistakenly reporting his death instead of his brother's. The newspaper branded him as the merchant of death for profiting from the weapons trade. Imagine the horror of seeing your premature obituary accidentally published, branding you for something that you stood against. Nobel underwent a forced temporal audit, a mirror held up to his life from the lens of history. Confronted with the grim perspective that his legacy could be one of death rather than creation, Nobel took action. He channeled his wealth into establishing the Nobel Prizes, honoring human achievement in science, culture, and peace. The Nobel Prizes became prestigious annual awards. Once associated with war, Nobel's name now embodies the height of human progress and peace. Thankfully, you don't have to have a premature obituary written about you to experience this reprioritizing shift in perspective. Instead, you can voluntarily run a temporal audit. This is what I did when I found myself dispersed across five projects. I stretched out the timeline and considered my pursuits over 30 years instead of just today. Looking that far ahead made the difference and importance between pursuits obvious. The three steps to running this temporal audit are first, to look at your immediate pursuits, to list out your current pursuits as they stand today, considering your immediate goals, needs, and wants. Then second, to look at your fantasy pursuits, list all the pursuits you want to do, but aren't yet doing. And then third, stretch the timeline to 30 years. Consider these same pursuits over a 30-year time horizon. How does it alter your sense of what's most important? It should add some HD vision to your ability to see what's truly critical. This temporal audit will help you reduce dispersion across pursuits so you can pick one boat, that is one primary pursuit, and exploit it, that is leverage it to get you to the beautiful oasis that represents all of your goals realized. But picking a primary pursuit is only one part of the process. As you know, there are equal opportunities for dispersion within a pursuit. And that brings us to phase two of mastering explore and exploit dynamics and eliminating dispersion. Phase two, to prioritize within your one pursuit. In phase one, you picked your boat. Now to captain the boat, well, we wanna offload anything non-essential within the boat that will slow you down or cause you to get dispersed within your primary pursuit. This will enhance your compounding focus. One way to do this is to use the does it make the boat go faster filter. Ben Hunt Davis was part of an underachieving rowing team. In 1998, they set themselves a crazy goal of winning an Olympic gold medal in just two years. For context, competitive opportunities for rowers are rare and they might only race a mere six times a year. Ben had his work cut out for him with grueling training and constant iteration of the team strategy. They challenged everything they did with the question, will it make the boat go faster? If it didn't make the boat go faster, they wouldn't do it. Gradually, the results improved. Before they knew it, their crazy goal started to seem almost sane. And on September 25th, 2000, Ben and his crew won gold at the Sydney Olympics. They were the first British crew to have won this event since 1912. So with your primary pursuit defined, like Ben and his team, you could filter every decision within it by asking, will it make the boat go faster? Put another way, will it make progress 
on my primary pursuit faster. Every new hire, every potential partnership, every company culture shift, will it make the boat go faster? Every career change, every opportunity, every new routine, will it make the boat go faster? Every shift in your schedule, every new relationship, every new project, will it make the boat go faster? If it doesn't make the boat go faster, then you probably don't want to do it. Along the way, you've probably accumulated a ton of heavy cargo that's also slowing down the boat. Heavy cargo, in this context, refers to the non-essential tasks, commitments, or projects that disperse and consume your time, energy, and resources, but don't significantly contribute to the success of your primary pursuit. For example, many companies accumulate approval processes that waste time. They have multiple bloated data collection solutions they never analyze. When you accumulate heavy cargo like this, it leads to insufficient reward, which is a known burnout trigger. When the stuff you're doing doesn't produce enough of the main result you're after, the itch to stop exploiting and start exploring comes on strong. In other words, you have a stronger itch to explore if you aren't getting enough out of your current boat. The key is to slice the excess cargo off, all of the unnecessary stuff that's not producing a sufficient reward. This cargo is what causes you to disperse within your pursuit. And of anyone in recent history, Steve Jobs was an absolute master of this, of cutting the heavy cargo to make the boat go faster. When Steve Jobs returned to Apple in 1997, the company was on the brink of failure. During the final quarter of 1996, their sales plummeted by 30%. They'd lost 1.4 billion and were 90 days from being insolvent. Fresh off a partnership deal with the industry dominating Microsoft, Steve Jobs reviewed the company's sprawling product line. Apple had been producing multiple versions of the same product to satisfy requests from different retailers. They had a dozen versions of the Macintosh computer. Jobs asked his team, which one do I tell my friends to buy? He got jumbled competing answers riddled with uncertainty. So Jobs cut the heavy cargo, slicing the product line down by 70%. One desktop and one laptop for business, and one of each for consumers. One year later, the company turned a $309 million profit. Billions of dollars of enterprise value ensued, and Apple became the most valuable company in the world. The rule here is clear. Deciding what not to do is as important as deciding what to do. Apple has lost its captain. I was stuck in a chronic phase of exploration, adding new products, modifying new things, and dispersing its strategy. It was chasing opportunity instead of compounding focus into its proven products. Jobs knew it wasn't the time to explore the unknown. It was time for compounding focus and to exploit the opportunity the prior exploration provided. So in order to use the does it make the boat go faster filter and to dump the heavy cargo, you want to do the following. First, determine the heavy cargo. That is, all the stuff you do within the pursuit, the roles you have, the projects you're entwined with, that do not directly make the boat go faster or that cause you to disperse. Then, dump the heavy cargo by removing everything non-essential to the primary pursuit. You can simplify your primary pursuit by doing less better. Find places where a small cause is producing a large effect, then strip away almost everything else. I'll give you an example of this process directly from one of my businesses. At one point in our journey, we got to the point where we had a 60 plus person functional organization, a big marketing team, a sales team and an ops team. There were roughly 2,400 hours of work being done by that team in a given week. But the percentage of those hours of work that actually directly moved the boat faster, contributing to our mission, was minuscule. So we reorganized the entire business, changing the team dynamics and sizes, and orienting everyone around the specific products and end results our customers most wanted. We cut all the cargo, the projects, departments, systems, vendors, that were not directly driving value for our customers. This allowed us to row the boat much faster and better now, phase three for eliminating dispersion is to persist with one pursuit. So you've picked one boat, you've cut the heavy cargo to make the boat go faster. Now the key is to keep sailing so you can catch the tailwinds that propel you all the way to your destination. Warren Buffett, a titan in the investment world, began his career in the 1950s, a time ripe with the potential for rapid wealth. Over the years, as the market evolved, many investment fads and can-miss opportunities surfaced, tempting many investors to deviate from their core strategies. During the tech bubble of the late 1990s, where Buffett witnessed peers reaping astronomical returns on technology stocks, yet he refrained from investing in them, sticking to his tried and true value investing principles. That is selecting stocks that appear undervalued in the market, but have strong potential for growth. He faced criticism, was labeled out of date, and many believed he had missed the boat on the future of investing. Yet, when the bubble burst, Buffett's prudence was vindicated and his strategy of investing in undervalued companies with long-term growth potential proved its enduring worth with his net worth exceeding $100 billion. The ability to stay the course is a testament to his mastery over the evolutionary impulses that drive human behavior. 
While others chased the latest craze, Buffett sailed the single boat he picked long ago. The game is to chase opportunity, explore, then compound focus, exploit, for way longer than our biology wants us to do so. Then we chase opportunity again, exploring for the second time. It's not that you can't do multiple things in a lifetime, it's about sequencing one thing at a time. We want to be a serial entrepreneur, not a simultaneous entrepreneur, exploiting until it makes sense to explore again. For example, as an explorer, Elon Musk bought Twitter, but as an exploiter, he's still working on SpaceX 20 years later. As an exploiter, JK Rowling focused on creating and developing the Harry Potter series. Decades later, she shifted to an explorer phase, writing under pseudonyms and exploring different literary genres. As an exploiter, Richard Branson founded Virgin Records. Decades later, he shifted to an explore phase and built Virgin Atlantic and Virgin Mobile. That's what it means to master explore exploit dynamics. But the middle step, compounding focus, takes 10 to 100 times longer than we tend to think. And the reason for this is because of linearity bias. We evolved in environments with local and linear threats and opportunities. Picture yourself as a prehistoric hunter-gatherer. Imagine hurling a spear at a mouth, throw that spear twice as hard it'll penetrate the mammoth twice as deep. Or if we picked berries twice as fast, we'd get twice as many berries. Simple, right? Well, linear thinking is intuitive because it follows a predictable pattern. Cause and effect have a direct proportional relationship. We naturally assume that if we put in twice the effort, we'll get twice the results. Work one hour, get one hour of pay. But this makes it difficult to wrap our heads around the counterintuitive nature of exponential curves. Exponential curves start slow. They appear to have negligible growth. Then suddenly they surge upwards, growing at an increasingly rapid rate, like a snowball rolling down a hill. This is compounding where small changes add up to big results gradually over time. For example, imagine you had an apple orchard with just one tree. For easy math, let's say it produces 10 apples in its first year. You add a second tree the next year. Together they produce 20 apples. In year three, you have four trees that yield 40 apples. For the first few years, growth seems linear. Then in year 10, after doubling your trees each year, you have 512 trees that produce 5,120 apples. In year 20, your 131,072 trees yield over 1.3 million apples. By year 30, your orchard covers land equivalent to 500 football fields. It produces over 536 million apples, enough to provide every resident in LA with a fresh apple every week. And this happens because of exponential growth, like a snowball turning into an avalanche. Don't underestimate the long-term gains that come from a single exponential pursuit. With one singular professional pursuit, you let time and consistency work for you instead of against you. When you wait, you win. Your skills compound, your knowledge compounds, your network compounds. For example, if you spend years refining a single skill like coding, you don't just become twice as good, you become the sought after expert, the one company's fight to hire at 10 times your initial salary. You've myelinated neural pathways until the skill becomes a second nature as breathing itself. Plus, through compounding focus, you can make a huge amount of progress with an extremely light touch. For example, after devoting years to mastering rocket science and spacecraft engineering early on, Musk can now lightly sketch a new spaceship design that builds on accumulated knowledge. And an army of engineers will set about turning a sketch into a reality. If we realized what we could gain from sticking to one project, we would stick to it. But our linearity bias blinds us to the exponential, which makes the promise of other projects more alluring. And that's where most of us mess up. We tend to explore again way too soon, well before compounding sets in. So what do we do about this? The solution is to walk the stairway to flow. Walking the stairway to flow means accepting that peaks are reached by persevering through plateaued terrain. As the godfather of flow, Mihai Csikszentmihalyi put it in his book, Good Business, Leadership Flow and the Making of Meaning, we usually pay attention to the things we like that interest us, that engage our skills, but the relationship works the other way as well. We get to like whatever we pay careful attention to. Because of this, a good strategy is to invest energy in things that have the potential to sustain growth, even if at first, we are not particularly interested in. Eventually, we learn more about them and interest will be awakened. You'll get plenty of flow throughout your career, but on the stairway to flow, there will be flow plateaus. With your primary professional pursuit, you'll have bursts of flow when challenge and skill are aligned, but over time, you'll become so skilled at it that you'll get bored and may lose access to flow within that pursuit. Remember, your wiring will then tempt you to enter the exploration phase again. In exploration, 
you get a hit of dopamine and it's easier to get back into flow, but you'll start over at square one. So here's the rule of thumb. When you reach a flow plateau, don't seek flow through premature expiration and the novelty that comes with it. Don't jump off an exponential curve. Instead, sit tight. Let the focus compound persist as you climb the stairway to flow. Tame your need for stimulation and excitement and flow will re-emerge as part of the ongoing exploration phase. As an entrepreneur or leader, for certain periods, good business can get pretty boring, but it's wise not to use your profession as a primary flow source because it can distort your decision-making to optimize for personal flow rather than for organizational success. When this happens, professionals start to use their teams, their colleagues, or organizations as a source of entertainment. They fiddle with it like it's a joystick they need to get a hit of dopamine from. The high flow performer instead opts for simplicity. They continue to exploit the primary pursuit. They accept the decreased flow and follow through. If you persist, a new challenge will pop up at the next level and you'll get back into flow. In the meantime, get a hobby that gives you the flow you crave. Take up skiing, mountaineering, or dancing. This will sustain you during low flow periods of exploitation and execution. Take on something that can feed the part of the mind that wants to explore so you can double down on the compounding focus. Now you might object, but I have too many passions or interests to focus on one thing for years or decades. Well, the mistake to avoid is thinking that you can't simultaneously scratch the exploration itch while continuing to exploit. You can understand, even though you'll focus on one primary pursuit for a long time during the exploit phase, exploring still occurs. You get to explore through depth in one primary pursuit instead of exploring other primary pursuits. This gives you the best of both worlds. We satisfy the evolutionary impulse to explore, we get the squirt of dopamine and get the most out of compounding in our primary professional pursuit. When you know that there's only one thing you're working on and everything informs that one thing and every reward comes from going deep and consistently focusing on that one thing, everything becomes simpler. Here's the rule to help you keep sailing in the boat you've chosen to command. When in doubt, choose the more focused option should only ever have two buckets for your pursuits. One is for compounding focus and the other is for strategic neglect. That which you blissfully ignore. The mistake our biology leads us into making is to have most things in between those two ends of the spectrum instead of us being binary about it. This leads us to half committing to mediocrity. Instead, as you reduce dispersion across pursuits within and away from other pursuits, your results will compound. And in working with thousands of professionals, we've seen that defeating dispersion and claiming compounding focus are the biggest interventions to help you get more flow and achieve your goals faster. Though this path is difficult, you can become your own puppet master, the captain of your biology and gain the compounding focus that changes the world. Another way to avoid dispersion and sustain compounding focus on a primary pursuit is to supercharge that pursuit with intrinsic motivation. That's because extrinsic motivation like money, status, and fame, while useful in the short term, wear off in the long term. To learn how to tap into limitless motivation, click here.